Hello, it's time for another screencast to demonstrate how we can make our cucumber scenarios cleaner and easier to maintain. What you see here right now is where we left off at the end of the last screencast. It's a simple scenario that validates that we get a thank you message. It reads, when I complete the adoption of a puppy, then I should see thank you for adopting a puppy. Let's go ahead and run this just so that we can make sure that everything is okay, everything's working. And there you have it. And while I'm at it, let me walk you through the remainder of the code that we wrote for our last screencast. Here are the three step definitions that we had. You see our given, we're basically saying visit homepage. Uh, the second step definition starting on line five compares the text on the screen with the message that we expect. And our final step definition on line nine basically navigates through a set of pages. And while we're at it, here is the page object that we created in the last screencast. It's called checkout page and line six through 10, we define the things that were on the page and the method on line 12 allows us to populate that page either by uh, populating it with complete default data or as we saw in some of the exercise from the last screencast, overwriting that default data. Populate page with data for checkout page and then we place the order. I received an email from somebody asking if I could show the remainder of the code in the project and so I think we'll real quickly go through that before we start this exercise. The first file I want to show you is one called env.rb and all I'm doing here is uh, adding the lib directory to my load path requiring a set of gems that I'll be using and you see this call to world where I'm passing the page object page factory that's what allows me to say on and visit in my step definitions so there's not a lot going on here I also have a file called hooks where I've defined a before and after block and the before block all I'm doing is creating my browser object and I'm resizing it and moving it to a specific position that make it most appropriate for the screencast, make it easier for you guys to uh, see everything happening. In the after, all I'm doing again is closing the browser. So let's take a look at the remaining page objects. But first of all, I want to look at each page individually. As you can see here, this is my home page and it has a series of listings for different puppies it has their names and it has a their their breed their gender and it has a button to view their details if you look at the name you can see that it is actually a div that has a class of name so we actually leverage that in our page object what I wanted to do on this page is I wanted to be able to say select Brooke, select Hannah, select Ruby Sue or whatever. And so let's go take a look and see what that ended up looking like. Here is my page object for home page. The first thing you'll notice is that I've got a, a URL defined here. And this URL is what allows me to say visit the page that will take me to that URL in a later screencast I'll show you how to get this hard-coded value out of your page object but for right now we're going to leave it there and then I'm declaring the divs which are those puppy names and the next thing that I'm doing is I'm declaring the buttons the view detail buttons now since I'm using the plural version of these all it really does is generate a method that returns an array of those elements that match that type. In fact, for puppy name, what we're doing is I created a method here called puppy names, where it's calling that generated method and walking through each of those and calling the text method. So in other words, this puppy names method, all it does is return an array of the names of the puppies. Here is my public method, adopt, and it takes a name, but you see I've defaulted it to Brook. So if I just say adopt, it will use Brook, or I could say adopt Hannah, and it would use Hannah. 
And the first thing I'm doing here is I'm calling my puppy's name to see what is the index of the name that's passed in. And then I am using that index to access the correct button in the array return from my buttons call so that I can click it. And that's all I have going on on the home page right now. If you click the view details button, you go to this details button where it has information about the puppy and the price and such. So if we look at my details page, the only thing that I have done here is declare my button. Now you will notice that instead of calling my button adopt me, I've actually stated what it is that the button does. It adds the puppy to the cart. And with that, let's go look at the cart. Here it is. You see it puts the puppy in the shopping cart. Gives some pricing information. Gives you the option to buy some other things for the puppy. And let's see what that looks like. Here that is. All I have done here again is just define the two buttons that I'm interacting with at this time. The first one is the complete the adoption button and I have named it proceed to checkout. The second adopt another puppy and again I have called it continue shopping. And uh, if you hit the complete the adoption page it takes you to the checkout page which is right here. And this is the subject of this screencast. If I fill in all of the values here except for the name field and save it, I get this error message. Name can't be blank. So in other words, the name field is a required field. And that's what we're going to work on this time. But first of all, Let's kind of inspect this just so we can see what it really is. You can see here the first thing that we have is we have a div that is called error explanation. Inside of that div I have an H2 or a heading that tells you how many errors you have and inside of that there is an unordered list with a series of list items and that those that unordered list contains the actual error messages that are displayed. So with that in mind, I want to write a scenario that performs the name field validation or edits. Let's do that right now. Okay, there you have it. When I attempt to check out leaving the name field blank, then I should see name can't be blank. So we're gonna to have to generate one step definition for that. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna to navigate to that page. So here, for the complete order, I want to use all the default values except for the name field. And there, I think we have it. Let's try to run this and see if it works. And it did. And so I think we might be done with this scenario. Or are we? To just say that we should find this field or this text here anywhere on the page 
is not very accurate, to be quite honest. It could show up anywhere in any form. And I think in this case, I want to be a little bit more specific. In fact, what I want to say is I want to say that if I look inside of the div for the errors and, and inside of the unordered list inside of that div, at that point, I should find this message name can't be blank. So let's take a look at how we might do that. The first thing I need to do is I need to add a couple of new uh, entries or a couple of new elements to my checkout page. And the first one is going to be that div. And this finds that div. It had an ID called error explanation. And the next thing that I want to do is I want to find the unordered list inside of that div. And I'm just going to call it error messages. Except there is no identifier for it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use another feature of the page object gem, which is that one in which I can pass a block to this method, and in that block I could find it. And the page itself gets passed to my block. So I could say something like this. So that will find the div. <clears throat> now I want to find the unordered list inside of that div. Well, Luckily, I can nest these calls within each other. So what I'm saying here is find the unordered list element inside of that specific div on this page. And that will find it. Let's go update my feature. And instead of saying, then I should see, I want to say, then I should see the error message name can't be blank and let's generate that and what I can do now is on checkout page error messages should include message so now what I'm literally doing is I'm saying look inside of this div and when you're inside of this div find an unordered list and that is what I want to look inside of. So let's run this again now with our updated scenario and see what, what it does for us. and it is still working and everything is good or is it well we talked to the developers of this and they told us that the way that the error messages are displayed are the same on every single page so in other words if i were testing an error condition on my shopping cart page it would actually also display the same div with the unordered list. And that's a very common thing in web pages. It's very, very common to find reusable panels or reusable portions of pages that are used on multiple pages. Things like headers, footers, navigational systems, message displays, error displays, etc. So, but at the same time, we don't want to copy this code all around in, so that we would have to go change it in multiple places if the developers did decide to change it at a later time. Instead, we want to have this code in one place and then have all of the pages be able to use it. And so what we would have to do, or what we want to do then, is we want to create a module and put this in it. And let's get started with that. Let's go down to our pages and I'm gonna call it error panel. I'm calling it a panel to distinguish it from the pages.
And all we need to do here is take these elements that were here, cut them out of here, and just paste them right into this. And that is done. There we have our, anal er our error panel. But in order to use it in our page, we need to require it, first of all, And when we require it, we require the file name. And then the last thing we need to do is we need to include the module. Okay, and with that in place, I believe we can try to run, whoop, we can run our scenario again. And every time we wanted to add the error panel to another page object, again, all we would need to do is require the panel and include it. And with that, I have one last thing to do, which is I want to make my error message check non-page specific. So if we're using these navigational methods on and visit and a few others that I'll be showing you in later screencasts, it keeps track of an instance variable for us behind the scenes called current page. And so now I'm going to say current page error messages should include the message that I'm interested in. And since we've made another change, we will run it again and see how everything goes. And there you have it. That is what I wanted to show you this week. And we have a second scenario. It looks really nice. Uh, it is doing a very nice specific check. We had to write very little code in order to get it to work. I hope you enjoyed this screencast.